Hey guys, uh, good to see you. At least when you're watching this video, obviously we're not seeing each other in person. But um, this is going to be a, a video about the remaining part of Unit 5. So in class, we pretty much finished Unit 5, or at least if you've watched the last two videos that I posted, you would have then concluded Unit 5. This is another portion of Unit 5, which purely deals with intelligence. And uh, what I'm going to do, if you look on your the calendar that I gave you, this one is broken down into a couple of modules. But I'm going to cover the entire uh, series of uh, connected modules in one video. So this video I anticipate to be about 30 minutes. And you can break it down into about three different sections if you would like, each one about 10 minutes. But um, this will kind of make it easier for me and also for you when going back and looking at the content. There are many updates available at the moment on my website. You can start looking at those as I learn more information. But uh, we're gonna go ahead and proceed with this unit here as we're starting more remote learning. So continuing unit five, we have psychological testing and intelligence. And there will be a quiz at some point on the content of this video, although I'm not entirely certain when you'll take that or how it will be administered. Typically, if we were in class, there would be a quiz on this, so we'll be figuring that out shortly. But moving on with the unit, unit five, again, psychological testing and intelligence. The first thing that we're gonna take a look at is, I'm gonna move this along here. Of course, my clicker that I use in class doesn't work while I'm recording these videos. So, you know, this guy right here. So, okay. So here we go. Uh, first couple of slides are going to look at breaking down models and theories about intelligence. And so the first two here is called a uh, factor analysis version of intelligence, also called sometimes G. And then on the other side of it, we have L.O. Thurston's primary mental abilities. Actually, the cluster of abilities for intelligence is what's used to create future standardized testing and uh, particularly well, not so much standardized testing, but at least in regards to the ACT and SAT, looking at certain aptitudes and abilities, you can kind of look at the list there and uh, maybe reason out how you would see some of those questions on one of those exams. The other side of it, general ability as intelligence, was debated by a guy named Charles Spearman, and basically he used factor analysis, which we'll be covering later on again in the personality unit. But the idea here is that a lot of cognitive abilities share something in common, and this becomes labeled G, which will stand for general mental ability. So uh, these are two theories of intelligence, but probably, uh, well, I went backwards, sorry about that. Um, uh, the larger takeaway is probably going to be this one. I think these are two models of intelligence that are often seen a lot more on AP exams, number one, but also as it's something that makes a bit more sense. And so this may be actually the most important slide from the whole uh, presentation, so make sure that you understand the difference between these two. I'm about to explain fluid intelligence and then crystallized intelligence. So fluid intelligence, I will compare to literally a fluid like water. If I was to have a cup of water and dump it out on the table, uh, what it starts with there, everything that exists as that quantity is going to decrease over time. That water will slowly evaporate depending on the temperature outside. Of course, I guess it's possible that it hardens and turns into a, a solid, but we're going to just assume room temperature is warm and the water is going to slowly evaporate. And this is kind of like fluid intelligence. You start with everything that you have. These are the abilities from an intelligence standpoint that you start with. And as you get older, fluid intelligence tends to decrease. So this is your processing speed, how you might be able to think on your toes. Um, fluid intelligence will decrease into old age, whereas on the other side of this, we have crystallized intelligence. So crystallized intelligence is uh, something that increases up to old age. What that means, if you take like a crystal, for example, it could constantly harden over time. You know, you can learn a new skill, whether you're 90 years old or 18 years old. There's really no limit on to, uh, as to when you could start learning something. But crystallized intelligence here is really what you accumulate over the course of your life as a result of your fluid intelligence. So it is the facts, the knowledge, the things that you've gained as a result of the abilities that you started with. And this is something that could increase into old age. So again, summing it all up, fluid intelligence decreases into old age. 
These are your reasoning abilities, your processing speed, your crystallized intelligence is what you're working with from that. So uh, the information that you've acquired from processing, from working with material, skills, knowledge that you've gained over time. Uh, and I went backwards again, all right, my bad. So uh, another model of intelligence, this one is not seen as often, but this is known as Sternberg's triarchic model of intelligence, which means there are three factors here. And so you can kind of just look over at this diagram. Um, he proposed that these are the three elements of intelligence that uh, are related to life success. And uh, there's three specific abilities here. So you've got having a practical intelligence, an analytical version of intelligence, and then a creative intelligence. And so think about it like your talents and expertise, how you might solve a problem, and then your general adaptability. Again, you'll be able to see those explained here, how we would investigate the three facets of Sternberg's intelligence. Again, you've got analytical, creative, and practical. And then uh, factoring into practical and how you solve problems and deal with everyday life. Of course, you also have to consider what's called tacit knowledge. You can read, but tacit knowledge is what you need to know to work efficiently in an environment, but it's not explicitly taught to you. And it's not often uh, even verbalized. So almost like unwritten rules, unwritten expectations and language, things that you kind of need to know to be successful and be efficient but they're not explicitly taught to you. Uh, and then the other model, again, we're about to finish it up with these, but uh, another model of intelligence is called the multiple intelligence theory from Howard Gardner. So this one has eight. This is where you have probably seen uh, some of these things identified. This is just uh, kind of a controversial theory because part of this has led to learning styles, which Hopefully by now in my class, you know, has uh, been disproven. Learning styles are not real. But a lot of testing over the years has emphasized certain abilities that are not necessarily part of Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. And so the idea is that there are many other important skills that are based on having certain types of intelligence, whether that's a visual intelligence, a linguistic, a logical, as the list goes on. The uh, takeaway from this is that there are just some ideas about various forms of intelligence uh, that exist out there. And in these in particular, where would you would see these is likely impacting a possible career choice. So, for example, if you look at this next slide here, you can see a way that different careers have been grouped by intelligence type. So, for example, if you are uh, ranking high in interpersonal intelligence, possible career opportunities that would be good for you would be like a counselor, a politician, a salesperson. This is because interpersonal versus intrapersonal is like how well you work with others versus how well you work independently. So interpersonal means, you know, if you, someone says, hey, you've got uh, strong interpersonal skills, what they're saying is that, you know, you play well with others. You, you work well with other people. So, you know, being in a position where you might be a counselor as a career and listening to someone uh, would be, you know, a good avenue to explore. Whereas if you were ranked high in intrapersonal uh, intelligence, these listed careers are things that are fairly independent. So a researcher, you're going to be doing a lot of stuff on your own. A novelist doing a lot on your own. Entrepreneur, again, a lot on your own. So hopefully you get the idea here with those. Um, and then lastly, we have emotional intelligence as a social intelligence. And what does that mean? And basically in our society, in our society today, we have people who have advanced emotional intelligence that are cognizant of that. They recognize that they may be better at actually perceiving emotions than other people. They might actually understand emotional behaviors better and therefore could predict how somebody might react to any given scenario or problem. They're better at managing their emotions, knowing the appropriate emotions and how they should use them. And then also just using the emotions in general to bring out creativity in people or uh, working through problems. So emotional intelligence is here classified as a social intelligence. It's fairly practical. And uh, speaking of creativity, the last thing I'm gonna show you here about this, unfortunately, we're not in class, so we won't get to do some 
creativity measuring test, which is a bummer, but again, this is the circumstances that we have. So creativity is pretty self-explanatory, I feel like, but there are different forms of creativity. It's a skill that you can practice if you don't feel like you're a very creative person. You might not be, but uh, kind of like learning to play an instrument, you can practice creative ability. It's not something that has to be fixed to the point that either you have it or you don't have it. Some of you may feel that you're already a really creative person. And then some people uh, may feel that you're just generally not creative. I know for myself, I have a very creative mind. However, from an execution standpoint, I don't have that ability. You know, I'm not artistic. I can't do anything with art. I'm not going to draw. I'm not going to paint because I know my ability is weak. But for coming up with ideas, I certainly feel like I have a bit of a creative mind when it comes to planning and putting things in motion, just not the actual execution form of creativity, which is, I think, what a lot of people would normally think about. Um, some types of thinking that are involved with creativity here, you see it says convergent thinking and divergent thinking. And so for convergent thinking, this is when you're taking like a multiple choice quiz and you're trying to converge on one answer. You're reducing your possibilities by gradually eliminating what's there, trying to eliminate down to just one option so that hopefully you've picked the best option. With divergent thinking, you're actually expanding your range of alternatives by generating lots of solutions. So divergent thinking is not something that you would see or use on a multiple choice test. But usually uh, the example I would give is that if you worked for a marketing agency, for example, and somebody's coming to you, they want to uh, you know, use your services to market their product. And uh, if you're going to excel in this kind of environment, being a divergent thinker is going to keep you on your toes and also continuously allow you to move forward with different ways that you might want to advertise a product. Somebody might suggest doing an Internet campaign. Somebody might suggest doing a billboard or getting some ads on TV. You're expanding the ideas. That's the whole mentality. And then uh, some of the world's most brilliant minds have uh, at some point in time even proposed a hypothesis basically about creativity and creative achievements. You'll see this here. It's called the threshold hypothesis. And the idea is that for someone to really truly be classified as a creative individual and make some kind of substantial achievements involved with creativity, there's a minimum level of intelligence that's required. And so uh, whether that is excelling at a practical level or an analytical level, uh, having this form of creativity is only really going to be able to be expressed in an achievement sense if they maintain a certain level of intelligence. All right, so uh, that is what I would say is going to be one of the topics of this uh, presentation. Again, reminding you that you can break these down and look at them however you would want. But as we move forward with the next topic, now we're looking at key concepts and psychological testing. And there's really three key concepts here, but I know there's going to be some other stuff to take a look at. So the first thing that you have to kind of accept is that there are two principal types of tests in regards to this unit. So you have the mental ability tests, and then you have personality tests. Now, we will be having a unit on personality uh, to finish off. That's unit seven. So we're a little uh, behind that at the moment, but we're going to get there. Mental ability, though, is what we'll see over the next couple of slides. There are a couple of different tests within the mental ability test. So, for example, you have tests at school, such as uh, testing your general mental abilities, intellectual potential. You've got a aptitude test. This is for specific mental abilities. That would be like taking the ACT or the SAT or even uh, doing an IQ test. And then lastly, you've got the achievement test. This is for content knowledge and mastery. This is going to be um, actually looking at this. I just made an error. So intelligence tests are where you're going to see the IQ test. Aptitude test is going to be for the uh, SAT, ACT, and then achievement tests. Sorry about that. Achievement tests are actually for like a unit test. Um, that's testing your knowledge, your content mastery. Then on the other side, you see personality tests. So the famous one here is the Rorschach ink blot test. And uh, there's many forms of personality tests, but that's just one example. Usually they're testing some form of personality metric, some assessment, whether it's a motivation and interest. Uh, and depending on the type of test, it could be scaled in its results. So uh, two of the three terms we're first going to start with is standardization and reliability. 
There's an example of what reliability would look like on a test here, but the general idea is how consistent is your test? If you take the test today and tomorrow, you should see a very similar result. Uh, standardization is about the way a test is given, how it's administered, it's scored the same way. So you get the same settings, you know, everybody has the same time limit, everybody has the same environment, the same test. That is what's standardizing it. When you look at reliability, um, the, the graphs here in particular, so a test that's low in reliability, a test that's low in reliability would be a test that today I get a high score, tomorrow my score is terrible, versus if I got a pretty good score yesterday and then tomorrow or today I get a pretty good score, I'm maintaining about the same. If you look at the graph um, for someone like Omar or Carl, on the low reliability side, their scores started off high, but then they kind of drastically started going down. That's not a good sign. Same thing for Ed and Dawn. They got bad scores to start, but then they retested and they now got high scores. That means it's not very consistent. If you stay about the same like Kim, in this case, then Kim, yeah, is pretty consistent. But compared to the high reliability side, Omar and Carl, they slightly go up. They stay about the same, though. Deb and Miguel and Kim, they get a decent score somewhere in the middle and they get about the same again. And then some others, they may slightly increase or slightly decrease, but ultimately it's about the same. That makes it reliable. There are a couple of forms of, of validity. So validity is the third term for key concepts of testing. And so you have content validity, predictive or criterion validity, and then construct validity. Content validity just means this. Um, if you take a test in AP Psych and it's on personality, you expect the questions to be about personality and personality theory. If you come in and it's a whole test about physics, that test does not have content validity. So you would probably have a problem with that as a student. When you go to the next one, criterion validity, if you were to take a uh, driver's ed class or you're training through a pilot's licensing program, if you have an hour of uh, fly a simulator experience, Chances are I would not expect you to do well on the pilot's training test. If you did driver's ed and you completed it, no problem. And then you have been doing your practice driving and you go and do the driver's test, I would expect you probably succeed with little problems. Same way if you were to do the flight simulator and you had a thousand hours of experience, I would probably expect that you would do fairly well. So that's predictive validity or criterion validity. You're satisfying something to see how it would measure up with something else. And then finally, we have construct validity. Construct validity is now in the realm of hypotheticals. And so if I was to give you a test and it said, guess what, you're really nice. Okay, that test is also saying something else. The other thing it's saying is, guess what? You're not very mean. So if you're ranking low in one, you should rank high in the other one. If you're ranking high in something, then you should be low in the other one. If you rank high in extroversion, you're probably not going to also rank high in introversion. It just doesn't exactly make sense. So we're saying there should be a negative correlation here in this uh, construct validity. And then here's a graph kind of like the other one where you can see validity. Uh, not much to really explain again on this, but just pausing for a second to show you it. All right, we move on. And now we're going to take a look at how intelligence testing has evolved over the uh, years. And so there's a couple of different individuals here who have played a role in the history of the test. We have the first useful intelligence test coming from Alfred Binet. This was in 1905. And this test was defined with mental age, which basically means if I was asking you, what is your mental age? That means what is your mental performance? compared to uh, chronology of where a child would be at that age. So mental performance is typical of an eight-year-old, for example, if you're eight years old, if you are in the right place intellectually. If you are 15 years old or 17 or 18 years old, like some of you guys, your mental age, it should match up with your chronological age, but it's not always going to. And unfortunately, mental age was very difficult for uh, early pioneers in this unit, in this field, to compare because how do you compare the mental age of someone who's seven years old with a seven-year-old mental age with someone who is 12 years old with a seven-year-old mental age? The comparisons were difficult to make. And so the test is gonna evolve 
And this next test is from Lewis Terman and his team at Stanford. And they combine mental age and then some of their own ideas. And they come up with what's called intellectual quotient. And this is where we get IQ. And so IQ is actually just your mental age divided by your chronological age times 100. So for example, if I'm 30 years old, both mentally and from chronology, and I divide 30 by 30, I get one. I multiply that by 100, my IQ is 100. Now, I'm assuming that my IQ is probably higher than that, and most people would make that assumption, but the average IQ is actually uh, in the range of 85 to 115, which means right down the middle, or right there, right down the middle, uh, that is 100. And so we might feel like we have a high IQ. You might have taken a test online that said, hey, fast free IQ. Guess what? Your IQ is 150. Well, I'm here to unfortunately tell you that's probably not true. So uh, there's not a lot of people out there who have IQs of 150 statistically. So the chances that it was you is probably pretty slim. Also, if you take a fast and free online IQ test, there's a good chance it's not very reliable or valid. And it's certainly not standardized. There's another person, David Weschler, who comes up with a uh, test for adults. This was kind of more for adults with disabilities because of the fact that many IQ tests are often using the same standards. What I mean by that, not to say that it's standardized, but IQ tests look at the same abilities. You have a dependency on verbal abilities. You have a dependency on fluency and uh, certain types of thought that is found on the ACT and SAT types of testing. And so his idea was that's already going to put people with special needs at a disadvantage. And so maybe, just maybe, a test could be made that would be more fair for those individuals. So let's address some basic questions that you might have about intelligence testing. Uh, what does it mean if you get an IQ score uh, compared to the normal distribution? And I can go ahead and show you. I kind of already explained this a second ago, but here's your bell curve or your normal distribution. So what you're seeing here is that most people, as in literally about two thirds of the population, have that IQ between one plus or minus standard deviation of the average. So the average range is 100, that's the mean. And so 85 to 115 is the IQ range that most people are gonna fall within. Then you go up to two standard deviations or down two standard deviations, and now more people, even more, 95.4% are gonna be between 75 and 130. The people that are beyond this cutoff are gonna fall into two categories. Those categories are intellectually disabled, so that's less than 70, and then gifted, which is 130 or higher. When you drop, again, another threshold, another standard deviation, now you're getting into extreme and profound intellectual disabilities, less than 55, and then greater than 145 is your profoundly gifted individuals. So those are very small percentages of the population, as you would imagine. Uh, are intelligence tests reliable and valid? The fast takeaway is yes, they are. And that's really all that needs to be said about that. So let's keep going. What about people who are uh, really looking to find out how smart is my kid going to be when they are three years old, when they're in preschool? What does that mean? Are IQ scores stable over time? And the answer is yes. However, you have to get to a certain age first. Preschool IQ is very unstable, okay? If you're three years old taking an IQ test, you might not have that same IQ if you're 12 years old or if you're 11 years old. So IQ balances out in the preteen years and then kind of reaches a point of stability where it should stay about the same. But again, if you are parenting and one day, should you decide to be a parent, um, if you're wanting to say, hey, I wanna figure out how smart my kid might be, First of all, you have to consider that loaded question. What does it mean to be smart? And are you associating IQ with smarts? Because there are many forms of intelligence that are not tested even on an IQ test. For example, if you are artistically creative or artistically gifted, that's not gonna show up on an IQ test. Uh, do intelligence tests predict vocational success? 
this is uh, conflicting because the answer is yes. If you have a high IQ, you do have a greater shot at landing a more high stage job than someone that doesn't. But there are also other factors. Actually, attractiveness is one of those factors. So if you're both low IQ and not very att attractive, you know, you might be a little more doomed than someone who has at least got one of those things going for them. But all uh, kidding aside, of course, if you work hard and uh, whether where, wherever you are in IQ, if you work hard and are committed, you will probably find some vocational success. Are IQ tests widely used in other cultures? The answer is yes. In a lot of Western cultures, IQ tests are pretty prominent. Um, however, if you go to a country like China, which is in the Eastern Hemisphere, you will not see IQ testing done the same way. It does not translate well into their language. Uh, the exception is in Japan. They do actually use IQ testing similar to America. All right, as we continue along, we have uh, another topic here, which is the extremes of intelligence. And this boils down to two things. You have giftedness on one side and intellectually disabled on the other side. And really, there's not a whole lot that needs to be shared here. I would say the main takeaway is that, you know, if you ever found yourself using the word retard or retarded, um, that's something that society has really moved away from in terms of classification. You may have heard of campaigns or pledges to end things like the R word. And uh, while I fully support that, it is a very difficult thing to do when there's not a lot of commitment to the cause. But intellectual disability is the official name or classification for someone that formerly was called having a mental retardation. And all this means is that somebody has a subnormal general mental ability. So they have below average uh, intellectual abilities. It's possible that they're invisible to you. It could be somebody literally in our classroom seated behind you or beside you and you would never know. If it was a very mild intellectual disability, which is what most people deal with, statistically, you honestly may not know. If it was moderate, severe, or profound, this is creating situations where you might be more cognizant of um, that person's disability. It might not be something that could say be hidden. Um, for example, in our society today, how we would label a intellectual disability is usually broken down into someone's deficiencies with adaptive skills before the age of 18. So do you have a problem with conceptual thinking, social functioning, building relationships or making relationships, but also practical things like, are you prevented from taking care of yourself? Are you prevented from having a job or being able to function in an environment where you're expected to act a certain way. These deficiencies could label someone as having an intellectual disability. Uh, one of the things that I will explain and show you is about Down syndrome, because Down syndrome is classified as an intellectual disability. And I've chosen this one because specifically most people are familiar with Down syndrome in some capacity because it's recognizable visually because of uh, the way that actually let me go back and I'll show you. Uh, so the origins of Down syndrome comes from having an extra chromosome. And uh, because Down syndrome has a particular look to it, even though there could be Down syndrome in a very mild or moderate fashion, there are obviously people who have other intellectual disabilities with Down syndrome that could give them a more severe or profound intellectual disability. But Down syndrome in particular, as it relates to human development and looking here at maternal ages, the incidence rates for Down syndrome begin to uh, increase drastically as a uh, female increases in age. So at age 20, for example, the incidence rate of Down syndrome births out of 2000 is only one, one in 2000. But if you're age 49, there's now a one in 10 chance of having a Down syndrome uh, developed within the uh, the baby. And so um, this is just kind of like a pregnancy risk kind of thing. But as you get older, you run the risk. And this is not just for Down syndrome, but with other intellectual disabilities as well. Some of them that are also marked by more physical disabilities. You run greater risks as you get older, which is why most people tend to try to have planned out their uh, 
their families, if they want to have a family, why it's often suggested that you do that earlier rather than later. Obviously, if you look into your 40s, you run the risk of having more complications with pregnancies, and one of those results could be in uh, the Down syndrome incidence rate. Uh, the other end of this is giftedness. So if you're gifted, you have a high IQ compared to the average. So we're talking about only the top two to three percent of society here. The typical minimum IQ for giftedness is 130 or higher. So you might feel like you're doing well if you have an IQ that's 110. And that's true. You are doing great. But in terms of giving you the distinct label giftedness, that doesn't occur until you have an IQ of 130 or higher. There's some other stuff on this slide. I'm just not really going to explain a whole lot more beyond that. But uh, one of the things that I think is special and worth mentioning is called the drudge theory. And so imagine that you are thinking about someone who's very, very successful. For me, it's easy to think about an athlete here because of the work they're probably going to put in, but also the raw talent that they might have. So if I said someone like uh, LeBron James Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, RIP. Um, these are guys, and I'm just choosing basketball because basketball is a sport I'm most knowledgeable about, but it could be anything. People who are the best at what they do, often you will find work harder than the others. And so that's really what the drudge theory is all about. You know, what's going to win out? Is it talent wins against hard work? Is it hard work can beat out talent? You know, there's some quotes out there, motivation. I think it's like talent fails to be hard work when hard work fails to work hard. But if a hard worker is putting in that time, putting in that effort and has some talent, whether it's a ton or a little, uh, they're going to be successful. And so the drudge theory is just kind of saying that people who are most talented are often people that you also see working the hardest. Kobe Bryant used to say kind of part of the Mamba mentality. He would go to the gym two hours before everyone else. And, you know, one day of being in the gym two hours earlier than everyone else, you know, one day of that is not going to be life changing. But imagine you do that over your whole career. It wouldn't take long before those extra two hours have added up to an extra thousand hours, an extra 10,000 hours. And you start reaching places in life where people cannot catch you from an ability standpoint and from a work standpoint, because you have put in all that extra time. And so it doesn't have to just apply to athletic performance. Of course, you could apply this to literally anything else. Working with schoolwork, I would give that as a good example. Since I'm a teacher, I should say that. But if you work hard and don't just entirely depend on innate talent, but you have a little talent, if you work hard and you practice and you study, you should be able to rise up to the challenge and the occasion and really do your best. OK, so we're almost finished. We're now getting into the final topic here, which is basically for intelligence. What about nature? What about nurture? How do we define nature and nurture in the realm of intelligence? And what does that look like? So we have family studies. We've mentioned these in the past, but the types of studies that are used to determine is intelligence inherited or is it conditioned? So twin studies particularly are going to be helpful for nature because you have an identical twin who's raised together or if they're reared apart and you can look at the correlation coefficients here, they're still pretty high. So twin studies imply that uh, there is a hereditary influence into intelligence. Adoption studies also do the same thing. If you take someone who is adopted and they're adopted into a family that puts a lot of emphasis on working hard, however, um, you could then use this for uh, nurture or nature. So if you're born into a family that has people who have technically low IQ, but you're adopted into a family with people who have a high IQ or who are very driven to work hard, depending on how you want to portray this study, the adoption study could actually go both ways. Um, today, intelligence is basically believed to be about 50% inherited. This is uh, called the heritability ratio. It doesn't have to just be for intelligence. You can look here and see some of the other examples. But for example, height and weight are much more likely to be inherited than just intelligence. There have been intelligence heritability ratios uh, anywhere from 40 to 80%, but kind of the more scholarly consensus today, although 
you know, 50% just makes it seem like, well, yeah, it's half nature, half nurture. But the, uh, the reality is that this is a tough thing to truly measure. But the estimate is that intelligence is 50% inherited. And so I'm fine with that model personally, because that means that, you know, 50% of what is making up your intellect is done from a natural inherited portion. But it also means that you could have 50% that you're making up through hard work and practice and being motivated. And so you rise up to the challenge. So I'm fine with that personally. When you look at the environmental influence, so no, we're not talking about nature anymore. We're talking about nurture. This is where you would see the adoption study. So children who show resemblance to their foster parents in IQ, that is the example I mentioned earlier. You know, you don't resemble your biological parents, but you resemble your foster parents. That would be uh, nurture. Siblings who are raised together in the same environment. Um, showing that they have a greater IQ relationship. If you are under the same household as say your sibling, for example, and you both ended up having a big drive to focus on education and uh, working hard and doing your best. Sorry, I keep raising my hand. It's so weird for me to just sit here and, and not move my hands. I'm a hand talker. Um, that's what this one's talking about. And let's see, uh, one of the final points here is called the Flynn effect. And the Flynn effect is the explanation for why have IQ scores steadily risen or increased over the years? If you think about it, you know, genetically, we're not really much different than people who were alive in 1910 or 1920, if we go back 100 years. So why have we seen that IQ scores have kind of very steadily gone up over the years? And this is purely attributed to environment. Think about where we are in terms of technology access today. We have um, a study guide and materials for tests like the ACT and the SAT. We have technology access. We have more exposure to the materials. We're more knowledgeable. We've probably refined some teaching strategies over the past hundred years that have also been helpful. And so these are all environmental factors. So again, this is called the Flynn effect. And uh, I know this is one thing out of many things that you're learning today, but this is actually one that has stood out over the course of the years, at least in my experience of uh, looking at exams. So I would say draw some special attention to this. And uh, as we close this out here, uh, finally, we're going to see maybe two more topics. So we've got reaction range. This is basically saying that heredity actually could limit. It may set limits on intelligence and environmental factors determine where we fall in those limits. So this is from Sandra Scar. And again, it's called the reaction range. It's the idea that our IQ has been genetically determined to have a limit and our environment is going to help us determine where we fall within that range. And lastly, lastly, here we get to what about some cultural differences in IQ scores? Um, traditionally, what's been seen is that minorities have tended to score on average about 10 to 15 points lower than um, Caucasians or white people uh, on these IQ testing results. And so there's a couple of different explanations for this. They relate to issues of heritability, socioeconomic disadvantage, stereotype vulnerabilities or threats. There's been a lot of different experiments and studies here to kind of look at some of these topics. But the big takeaway is that, you know, IQ tests um, don't need to be determining your overall path for life. Uh, despite the fact that some of these results have been found, you know, the explanations here are saying that race must be social and not a biological concept for heritability. The idea that the problems that are created between uh, or the problems that are created are boundaries that are between racial groups. They're porous. They overlap. And so we are inheriting then these problems which are going to impact your IQ results. But socioeconomic disadvantage is probably the easiest one to understand. There used to be this story about uh, the seed bag story, growing a seed. If I had a flower, two flower pots and in one I take the same seed, but in one pot I, I put the seed in there with um, you know, the most nutritious soil and it gets fertilizer and it gets watered daily. What am I going to expect that seed to produce and how much of a quantity is that seed going to produce in terms of flowers and, and blooms? Um, what blossoms on the flower? But if I take a seed and I put it in a pot that gets the wrong soil 
or really crappy soil or I don't water that seed daily. It doesn't get its nutrition. It doesn't get fertilizer. What is the result going to be for that seed? And so the idea here is to move away from race. And instead, it's saying that ethnic class disadvantages are really social class disadvantages in disguise. And to say that it's not about race, it's actually about, excuse me, uh, wealth. And a seed of any kind, whether it's a black seed, a white seed, a green seed, a yellow seed, a brown seed, it needs to have those resources. It needs to have the great soil there or the right soil. It needs to be watered consistently. It needs fertilizer. It needs nutrition. And then any of those seeds can turn into the same amazing, beautiful creation. And then lastly, we have stereotype vulnerability. This does not have to just apply to both, uh, race, but also could apply to um, gender as well. So there are derogatory stereotypes which create feelings of vulnerability in education. For example, it could be walking into a test, you're told, hey, because you're a female, you're more likely to do worse on this test than the male counterparts. Or because you are African American, or because you are Latino, or because you are white or Asian, or whatever it has to be, um, you can create a stereotype vulnerability, which means you're making someone actually afraid of becoming a stereotype. I don't want to be another statistic. I don't want to be one of the minorities who might score lower than white students. And there's actually been some testing here that has proven it uh, in various forms. You could make the white people become the minority or you could have uh uh, the black people become the minority. There was some tests done at the college environment where students were brought in and they were told in advance of taking a test, depending on different demographics and there is changed around. So in one instance, it could be that white students were told they were going to do worse or black students were told, were told they were going to do worse. And um, what happens after they take the test? They do worse. Why are they doing that? Because it's starting to undermine their emotional investment. It creates test anxiety. So you create a lose-lose scenario. If you start thinking about your abilities and, oh, man, am I going to be a statistic? Am I going to do worse? And then you end up actually doing that. So these are some examples to look at uh, cultural differences among IQ scores. But, uh, wow, we made it to the end. So. Thanks for staying with me here. I'm sure this is probably going to be about a 30 to 40 minute video, so you can digest this over a couple of days if you would like. I wouldn't expect you to go through all of this at one time, although I'm sure some of you will. And uh, as always, stay healthy out there and uh, I will look forward to communicating with you in the future. All right. Have a good one.